expert. So I am I'm a GIS user, but um, but but not a technical expert. Um, I will point out my co-author on this presentation is Allison Smith, who I um, teach with at University of Georgia, and she is much more of the, the technical expert related to GIS. But I am going to talk about um, how we are using GIS in some of our graduate landscape architecture studios, and um, in in doing so. Um, bringing this process of what we're calling geodesign. Has anyone heard of the term geodesign? A few people. Okay. It's, um, there's a book, A Framework for Geodesign. It's published by Esri Press, um, written by Carl Steinitz. And that kind of will outline what geodesign is. But briefly, I will... Uh, now it's tough. Yeah. And uh, that's, not, that's not advancing that. I'll just use this. Since Camtasia is now, it should be able to do it. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so geodesign, um, to define it, you can read here, geodesign is a method which tightly couples the creation of proposals for change with impact simulations informed by geographic contexts and systems thinking and normally supported by digital technology. Um, this is a definition coming from Michael Flaxman and Stephen Irvin. Um, this is coming out of the first geodesign summit, which was held out in Redlands, California back in 2010. So geodesign is really a process, <clears throat> and it's, it's not all that different than traditional landscape architecture and land planning, but it does create a bit of a, a framework for um, introducing some of what's mentioned here in the definition, which is specifically generating multiple scenarios for a design problem and then critically evaluating those scenarios using um, qu quantitative performance metrics, which is a bit of a leap forward from um, some of the more qualitative judgments about good and bad design that we've maybe used in the past. Um, it's very much a participatory activity, and you can see this is kind of adapted from the, the cover of Carl Steinitz's book, the image here, but very much collaborative between design professions, the sciences, the geographic sciences, the stakeholders or people of the place, and then of course the technology aspect, which is hopefully integrating and facilitating this activity. So I mentioned um, the Geodesign Summit, which been, has been held annually in Redlands since 2010. It's a small conference of about 300 people, and it's, it's really been, I've been just the last two years, but it's really been a great um, gathering of people that are really excited about the, the integration of design and design process with you know, the power of the data-driven power and geographic power of, um, of GIS. And, um, and so, yeah, it's been a lot of fun. You can see the, the kind of the intimate uh, setting here at the conference with the couches and Jack Dangerman and Carl Steinitz, you know, gathering on the couches for these thought-provoking discussions. Uh, so with that, I wanted to provide a couple of case studies about how we're, you know, maybe tweaking some of our landscape architecture uh, uh, teaching to uh, incorporate some of these ideas of geodesign. So the first project that I wanted to present as a case study is a project that we took on in our studio in 2013, the fall of 2013. And this is a project in Atlanta on the Chattahoochee River. Um, for those of you familiar with Atlanta, uh, is there a laser on this? The green? OK. Um, so here is Atlanta with 285 surrounding Atlanta. And the Chattahoochee River flows from North Georgia flowing southwest, really along the, um, the western kind of edge of metro Atlanta, and then of course down along the Georgia-Alabama line and into the Gulf of Mexico. It's the primary drinking water source for uh, metro Atlanta, and, uh, and, and the major river, having said all that, it's pretty much ignored by the inhabitants of the city. People just aren't aware of it other than knowing that that's where water comes from and that's where sewage goes. But but it, there's not much uh, awareness of it. Um, so it's been neglected. Uh, in tw because of that neglect and also, of course, the, the growing um, population of Atlanta, there is a concern for managing and stewarding the future of the river. So an organization called Chattahoochee Now was uh, created, 
and it's a nonprofit organization that brought together, a, well, a number of stakeholders. Let me go here, all kinds of stakeholders um, that have a stake in the river and the, the future of the river to bring a, bring them all together and start thinking about how do we manage development and land planning um, along this river corridor in the future. So we took this on really at the early stages of the thinking of this project. Um, you can see myself and Allison Smith were um, studio instructors. We had a huge landscape architecture studio. This is second year graduate landscape architecture studio. We had 36 students in this class, which was double our normal size, but we had a, in that year, a huge influx of um, uh, international students coming from China that um, really doubled our numbers. Um, and those students had really interesting backgrounds, a number of different uh, backgrounds, different ologies, um, anthropology and ecology, and biology, but also architecture and engineering and so forth. So we had a good, good diverse group. Um, and then all the stakeholders on this project, <clears throat> all the different ag agencies involved. Okay, so that's who was involved. The purpose of the project, really, at, like I said, at the early stages of this Chattahoochee Now organization, um, they had their mission, which was to create a vision for the future of the river corridor, undefined relatively in terms of its width, but just the river corridor that balances conservation, recreation, and development, kind of our, our pretty standard land planning um, uh, purpose. So we wanted to, of course, provide the resources or the, the foundation for Chattahoochee now to create that vision. Um, part of that was research. We need to understand everything else that had been, been done in terms of previous studies and, and, and research, generate a suitability analysis um, for uh, land planning, and then, <clears throat> of course, acknowledge and interact and engage all the stakeholders, which you know, Chattahoochee now was, was handling most of that, and we were able to just benefit from, from their efforts. And then finally, um, of course, this is a landscape architecture studio class, so we're needing to meet the learning objectives of our course, which was really about teaching the process of inventory, land suitability analysis, and we're teaching it through the, the structure now of geodesign. Do you know what we did before to make it advance? Uh, yes. <laughs> I'm not sure what. Why is it not doing it? There you go. Um, so I just have to click something. Okay. So here's our process. Um, inventory, analysis, and then design. In the course with 36 students, we're having to manage this, this big group. Uh, we wanted to balance group work and individual work. And you can see kind of the outline here. Um, inventory, we started with project research, did some case study investigation, and, um, and really data collection to create the inventory of, of this, um, this region, our project area. And then we analyzed that data to create a suitability analysis, and then moved into the, the design phase, which was really the land planning. You can see kind of our workflow or process outlined here in a couple different ways. One on the left is just my sketch on the whiteboard of our studio, and then on the right is a, a bit more um, refined presentation of that in one of the student products. But just real quickly to describe our process in detail, started out with research, we had each student um, do case study analyses of river projects internationally. Any, they could pick one as long as it met the minimum criteria of being a river project in an urban area. And we just wanted them to, to understand the possibilities for what the future of the Chattahoochee um, could incorporate. Uh, then we divided into inventory groups. And these were, um, as you can see here, six groups of six students each. and. In a class discussion, we divided our inventory and data gathering into these six different topics and then started brainstorming what is the data that we need to make decisions about the future of this, this river corridor. And you can see that again on the whiteboard here in our studio, just Liz. Now at this point, we didn't know what data we had access to that was available to us. Some of it we you know, had a sense of what was available, but some of it was just what data do we need? What, what are we going to look for as we go out and start the um, the gathering of data. And so that was here, and then the students went to work on that, collecting data, and um, a lot of it was provided for us by um, Jacobs Engineering, which was already doing some pro bono work on the project, uh, but a lot of it had to be gathered outside of, of what was provided to us. Um, 
this image here represents six of the those those six inventory maps that were created by the students. And I will point out that the students in this course came from, as I said, a number of different backgrounds. Probably the great majority, 90%, had never opened GIS before. So this was not only teaching a process, but also trying to provide some um, introduction to the software, which was very challenging. We were fortunate that we did have some experienced GIS users in the class that could help mentor their classmates. Um, but there was a lot of um, uh, managing of the data itself on the part of Al my you know, co-teacher Allison Smith um, and a lot of instruction in GIS also. Um, and with that information, you can see on these, these images, we're still working at a pretty much a five county scale. The river, as you can see the blue line here, um, running through the middle, but we hadn't really defined our project boundary yet during this data collection phase. With that data collection done, we were able to analyze the resources of the river and its surrounding area and start to be a bit more strategic about defining the site area. And what we found after really trial and error um, and experimenting with a couple different ideas, you know, we, we looked at the Huck 12 watersheds, we looked at um, land use, we looked at the, um, you know, develop, you know, future land use zoning and so forth. And what we ended up um, coming up with was a three mile buffer on either side of the river. Um, so that takes our 53 mile linear corridor and um, 318 square miles of, um, of area for the study area. <clears throat> then we moved into analysis, and this was um, you know, really building off of your standard suitability analysis you know, um, done in GIS. And in order to do the suitability, we had to start thinking about what are the proposed uses of this corridor. What sorts of things do we want to incorporate into the eventually the, the, the land use plan? And so you can see those program elements listed here, things like active recreation, agriculture, different types of development, of course conservation areas, um, transportation enhancements, industrial development, and so forth. And so we had 12 different program elements uh, or land uses that we needed to generate suitability maps for uh, within this corridor. Each of those program elements has different criteria that will determine whether the land is suitable for it or not. And so the next phase of, of the project was once these were defined, is, is going through all of our data that we had collected on topography and flood pains and hydrology and soils and development and everything else and looking at what are, what are the data within each of those um, those layers or themes that make a certain piece of land more or less suitable for, for one of these uses. So in this case, the students were broken up into 12 groups of three students each to determine the suitability criteria for each of the uses and then generate suitability maps for that particular use. So after this phase, we ended up with 12 different suitability maps, uh, one for each of the different uses. And unfortunately, uh, managing the, uh, the consistency of the, the graphics in this class got away from us a little bit. And uh, <laughs> so lots of different uh, color ramps and um, even orientations of, the, uh, of the, the, the site shown here. But eventually we did get them to, to get everything consistent into a, a gray scale of suitability so that it could be shared with all the other students in the class and used to um, generate a composite suitability, which I'll talk about here shortly. But throughout this process, of course, we were um, engaging with our stakeholders and getting feedback. You know, the suitability maps, uh, the criteria that they generated was based on research, but there was a lot of, there's a lot of um, intuition and, um, and, and judgment that goes into those suitabilities. And so the stakeholder feedback was really important to sort of calibrate the criteria that was used for the suitability to make sure we were consistent with, um, with the stakeholder intent as well. So we had presentations at each of these phases where the stakeholders came to Athens and, and, uh, and responded to what they were seeing. And there was a kind of a cyclical process of revising this, uh, you know, these assessments. So um, each of the students then individually were to take all 12 of those different suitability maps 
and create a composite suitability, which is essentially creating the base map for their land use plan. Um, we left it pretty wide open in terms of methodology on how to bring those 12 maps together into one. Um, there are many different ways to do it. We talked about, you know, kind of the traditional McCarg method um, of, you know, kind of how the overlay used to work and how you would maybe use a constraining method of taking your, your highest priority program element and, and setting aside the most suitable area for that and then seeing what's left over and taking the most suitable areas for your second priority program element and kind of doing that kind of constraining method. Many of the students did that. <clears throat> um, we had some, uh, here's an example of that. So this student, and you see just a third of the corridor here shown in his suitability and then the final land use plan that came out of that. What this student did from his suitability to the plan, um, he really was emphasizing and prioritizing um, preservation and creation of urban agriculture opportunities. He was very interested in food deserts and food security. So that became his highest priority. So from the suitability, um, he basically set aside all of the um, most suitable areas for urban agriculture and then moved on and looked at, okay, well, what's left over? Where can we fit in residential and so forth after that? And so you can see his master plan here, or land use plan. We had other students using different methodologies. One of the most successful ones was using the LUCIS strategy, which is the land use conflict identification strategy. Um, you can get more information about that in the book by Paul Zwick and Peggy Carr called LUCIS. But essentially what this did is <clears throat> using all of the suitabilities, having GIS um, analyze the, the overlay of that and identifying conflicts. And it's kind of an ingenious way of, um, of organizing the data, but essentially what it does, this student had to consolidate the 12 different suitabilities into three, and she grouped them into recreation elements, development, and conservation elements. Um, and then, so if, if each of those has suitabilities, one being least suitable and three being most suitable, so you have one, two, and three, um, classification of, of land use for each of those, and you can overlay those and using digits um, of essentially the, the singles digit um, representing one of those uses, the tens digit representing another, and the hundreds digit representing another, you can get a chart that starts to tell you, you know, either 111, 112, 121, or 211, you know, and it's a way of organizing the data to, uh, to understand where there might be overlaps of different suitabilities. So a 111 would be not suitable for conservation, not suitable for recreation, and not suitable for development. Um, a 333 three would be very suitable for all three of them. So if you have a 113, that tells you, wow, it's really suitable for one thing, it's not suitable for others, that's a very straightforward decision to dedicate that land to the, the number kind of three. A 133, you've got a conflict, and now there needs to be some judgment about which of those two things that it's suitable for um, is, is chosen, or is there some way to balance conservation and development if they both have threes, for example, some kind of conservation development. Um, so it can really lead into the, the zoning or the land use plan in a pretty organized way. <clears throat> um, so this is the land use plan that came out of um, that LUCIS process. Okay. Uh, so with 36 students in the class, we ended up with 36 different land use plans for this, uh, this corridor. And again, the intent of the course um, in terms of meeting the learning objectives was not to, we were not private consultants, we were not focused on generating one single plan that was the end all be all, but we wanted to get a range of ideas that could facilitate um, you know, private practitioners and consultants building off of this, and of course give something to Chattahoochee now to, to serve as a base for them to, to move forward in their thinking. What we've actually done now is hand this project off to Georgia Tech, uh, UGA, Georgia Tech cooperation in this case, and their College of Architecture is doing site scale um, urban planning for the development nodes that were identified in some of these projects. OK. 
Okay. Um, here's one of the project kind of <coughs> flow charts that was uh, produced by one of the students. Okay, so that's yeah, you know, that was that was 2013. We've used this same process um, this past fall, a different project. One of the objectives of our the, the studio that we teach is to take on these service learning projects that give the students opportunities to work with stakeholders on a variety of different projects. So we're always taking on different projects. In this case, it was a project in Athens that was um, two pieces of land, both publicly owned. Um, one of them is a sensitive environmental habitat. It's a, a granite outcrop that's protected by the Department of Natural Resources and the county. And then nearly adjacent to that is a 500-acre parcel that's a, a wastewater treatment plant. Only 40 acres of that 500 is taken up by the plant. The rest of it is just basically off-limits public land at this point. So we were looking at a, um, master planning that whole region of, of Clark County and in, or, in a way to make it more publicly accessible and useful um, from a, uh, a recreation standpoint. And so again, with the, the inventory and the suitability, uh, suitability analysis um, being done, we moved into um, design. And again, this student um, shown here used the Lucis model, and I can, well, you can, you can see the chart here where she's got, um, let's see, development, um, recreation, and conservation. You can see the, the ones, twos, and threes. And for each of those, there's a description of the conflict, which is, you know, in this case, low conflict equal preference for 111. Um, in this case, there is a 112, so there's a conservation preference, but only a medium, um, medium suitability, and so forth. So this kind of describes the conflict or agreement of the suitabilities. And then here is the resolution of the land use that would coincide with, with that conflict or agreement of suitabilities. <clears throat> um, in this case, we had the students um, specifically generate multiple scenarios, and we had them kind of put on the lens of an environmentalist or a developer or um, in this case, the mountain biking community was very interested in what we were doing. So they were kind of our representative of the recreation side of things. So each student had to do a, a recreation design, a conservation design, and a development design. And then we had them um, kind of critically evaluate each other's based on how well it achieved a balance of the three things, even though they were supposed to focus on, on one at a time. Um, when they came back, um, and eventually worked through and developed master plans for each student. Um, and then at the end of the master plan, and you can barely see this, um, they um, picked out a specific portion of the site and actually did site scale site engineering designs and, um, and generated some performance metrics on stormwater runoff and, um, and habitat and ecology and so forth. So that we were, in 2014, I felt like we were able to really kind of bring it full circle of some of the different scenarios that were developed and then the, the critical evaluation of those scenarios and then all the way down to the scale of grading and drainage and an actual um, quantifiable models of, of some of those site scale performance metrics. Um, the last thing that I'll mention is, well, two more things. Um, this spring, just a few, about a month ago, we had a geodesign workshop in Athens and had Carl Steinitz come out <clears throat> with one of his um, PhD student advisees that he's working with um, who's creating his own, and, and the advisee is um, Harishi Balal. And Harishi is developing an open source um, geodesign piece of software. It'll be available this summer when he finishes his dissertation. And it's, it generates stuff like this. Um, it, it runs, it's a very simple in terms of the technology, and Harishi, you know, is, will, will say the, exactly the same thing. Um, but what he takes is a, um, uh, essentially, suitability maps generated through GIS for different systems related to a project. In this case, we are working on a, um, a land use plan for Chatham County and specifically the Wormslow Historic Site within Chatham County, which is um, where Savannah is. And um, we identified 10 different systems. 
So you know, we had um, you know hydrology um, and agriculture development. You know, your typical kind of land uses as our systems. And we had suitability maps that, that we at UGA generated for each of those 10 different things. And then in a workshop setting, which is really what the software is, is meant to be used in, um, we had stakeholders in a workshop identifying different project and policy solutions to issues related to those 10 systems in Chatham County. And so here in green, you, can, you know, this is a whole grid. Each one of these columns is a different system. So here was the ecology um, column. There's a transportation column, I think this one over here. And each one of the little maps that you see here is a single design idea that would address some issue related to that system. Each, each map here is a different design idea. So there were hundreds of them generated. And the software is just an easy, you know, generate a polygon, generate a line, generate a point real coarse, as you can see here, um, in terms of its, its graphics. Uh, but what this does is it puts it all available uh, on the internet for the stakeholder, or for the, the workshop participants, and then for them, for each, each participant to create their own land use plan, they're just picking and choosing ideas that have been generated by someone in the group. It's all kind of open and available. And so you can get infinite number of, um, you know, um, uh, combinations of these plans that, uh, that address different uh, perspectives and, and, uh, and interests. So it's really a, a neat collaborative tool um, and of course uh, sets, sets up the, uh, the product of the workshop for you know, future refinement and, and thinking about what needs to happen next. For our fall 2016 studio, um, we're really excited to incorporate one of the new um, Esri apps, and this is the GeoPlanner app that has just become available. And it essentially should facilitate um, the generation of scenarios and the, the critical kind of quantitative um, evaluation of those different scenarios. Has anyone played around with GeoPlanner? No? Okay, so it's available now. Um, it's a web-based um, interface with, uh, with GIS, so all of the data has to be hosted on ArcGIS Online. And it takes a lot of the tools that we're all familiar with you know, from ArcGIS Desktop and really streamlines them and takes a lot of the confusion out of, of using these things. And so if you start out with a, um, you know, a, a let's say, a, a land use plan of an urban area um, as, as a base map, you can start to draw on top of that that land use plan, um, you know, different land uses. Start thinking about future, you know, different scenarios. What if we change this to residential or change this to commercial? And it's just real quick, kind of drawing polygons. <clears throat> um, each of those, with data that you would, um, you know, kind of make decisions on yourself or input, um, will generate kind of a dashboard output of of metrics that can be used to determine, you know, the the effect or impact of that design scenario. And then it does allow you to compare those scenarios to, to another. You can generate multiple scenarios. It also streamlines the the whole suitability analysis um, process. So the data that you have uploaded on RTS online can be um, can be displayed or organized into um, suitabilities simply by dragging um, these you know, little toggle bars. And in terms of created, creating uh, weighted overlays, it's simply picking the, the layers that you want and determining um, what percentage weight those, those layers should have. So it, it kind of, uh, for, for our students that don't have GIS experience, if we get all the data <laughs> prepared for them and uploaded on ArcGIS Online, the geo planner, I think, will be a much less intimidating way for them to to utilize some of the uh, those functions. Uh, all right, um, I guess that's about it. Maybe, maybe next year I can come back and talk about how geo planner works in the studio environment. Thank you. You ready to jump up here? Or do you want to do questions now? What's your preference? Anyone have any questions for Alfie? And we'll, we'll have some questions afterwards too for both speakers. As you look at the uh, quality of life dashboard, you can see that uh, Mecklenburg County has 
Yeah, so the question is, have I looked at the quality of life dashboard from Mecklenburg County? And I just saw that session this morning, and I was thinking the same thing. I need to look at the quality of life dashboard from Mecklenburg County. Yeah, it looks great. I'm, I'm excited to try that out. I have not looked at it in the past. Yeah, yeah, it looks great. Yeah. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, so in uh, going from 12 down to the three, the students were, most of the students who did, not every student did that, but, but the ones that did generally um, lumped together recreation-oriented, uh, development-oriented, and conservation-oriented uses. And most of them put the forestry and, um, and agriculture into a conservation category, although that, you know, that has to be understood on the part of who's doing it, what exactly is included in their, in their category. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. I do. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, um, he will be finishing his dissertation in July, and at that point he said that he was going to make it available. I believe, it, it, I don't think it has an official name, but, um, but we were accessing, accessing it through a website, um, geodesignstudy.com. I don't know if that is, um, you probably won't be able to get into it at this point, but there should have, that would at least be the place to look um, in a few months. Geodesignstudy.com. Yes, sir. Okay, so we were considering this, this kind of spatial um, part of it. We were not really considering temporal um, uh, part, as a part of the design, but I think that would be a good solution is to think about, you know, how things, you know, a five-year, 10-year, 50-year kind of evolution of, of the land use, but we, we did not get into that level of detail. We, in terms of the spatial evaluation of their plans, we were looking at um, how well did their plan how, how consistent with it was it with the suitabilities? So we didn't want them suggesting things that were in conflict with the suitabilities that were generated. In terms of if something is was identified as suitable for conservation and suitable for, let's say, residential development, that that is a conflict between those two land uses. But there are, you know, there are. Um, development policies that could be put in place there that would help to manage that conflict. So you could say, you know, maybe maybe that's where a conservation zoning ordinance would be appropriate or some kind of overlay district that would allow for residential development but only allow it if it met certain criteria in terms of, you know, concentrating the development on a portion of the site. And so so that would be the the design component is, you know, you see where those conflicts exist and then start thinking creatively about are there design or policy solutions that can manage that conflict, or do you just have to decide, we're just going to prioritize conservation over residential and and say no residential in this area? Absolutely. Yeah, with the Chattahoochee Now Project, it was 
the organization Chattahoochee Now had already engaged this you know, huge group of stakeholders, and it was really quite representative, at least from an agency and you know, an organizational standpoint, it was very representative. There was not great representation of individual uh, citizens and the public at this point, but that is something they will be working on as they carry the project forward. Um, with our, the, the, the other um, Rock and Shoals project from last fall, we did work with the local county, we worked with the Department of Natural Resources, and then we worked specifically with the SORBA, um, which is the Southern Off-Road Bicycle Association group from a recreational standpoint. So we, we, we did, but we kind of kept our stakeholder engagement focused on organizational level stakeholders just because of the nature of trying to manage a, a, this in a, a semester-long course project. All right, thank you. Thank you.